chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Then he, Jesus, went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and followed him. Now it happened, as he was dining in Levi's house, that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you as your children, your sons, your daughters. And Lord, we need you. We need to be healed Lord, we've all been affected by sin, the burden of sin, and we need Jesus. And we ask God that you would comfort us today, heal us by your word, through your spirit, that you would speak to us and draw us to yourself and help us to call upon your name that we might be healed, that we might be set free from our sins, that we might have a better understanding of who you are, and that we might worship you today in, in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you just uh, quietly continue to pray where you're at, uh, praying for the Lord of the universe to send the Holy Spirit to attend to our time, to open our hearts, to receive the word this morning, and for the assistance that the preaching needs, the unction of the Spirit. So would you please pray that right now where you're at, just quietly. Father, I join with your people in beseeching you this morning, Lord, calling upon you to send your spirit to attend to our time. I ask, Father, please, you would do that for the preaching and the receiving of your word. Father, that you would send your spirit. We beg you, we plead with you that you would do so. Father, that our hearts and minds would be open, that we would not be distracted this morning, that we would hear your word, Lord, given to sinners, that we would rightfully understand, Father, who we are and what we've come from. Dead in our sins and trespasses, Father, but by your grace, you've given us new life. You've caused us to be born again in Christ. What a thing for us to fathom, the amazement, the awe of your grace. So, Father, may that be true of us this morning. May we be in awe of your grace. And I ask, Father, please, that you would help me. Father, you would guide and direct my heart and my mind and my words, my mouth, my tongue, and everything, Lord, that it would be pleasing in your sight this morning that I would be a servant of Jesus Christ and a steward of your mysteries, empowered by your spirit, Lord, to speak your truth to your people for this moment and this time. Father, that it would resonate through our souls, that we would be fed and that it would be satisfying. So I ask, Father, please, that you would do so this morning, that we would rightly understand your word this morning, that you would forgive us our sin, Father, that our sins would be taken away, placed at the cross, that as you have done so, Father, as you've taken us out of the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved Son, We have that redemption, that forgiveness of our sins. That is what is there for us. May we be a forgiven people, Father, by your grace, by your mercy. Please, I ask now for you to please send your spirit to attend to our time. Be glorified in what we do. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So we're back in Mark. Um, We're back in Mark and we're looking at 
the calling of Levi, but we're also looking at what Jesus has done. And I want to just put a little bit of a theological grid from the epistles from the Old Testament before us this morning. As we look at the text this morning, what is Jesus making well known to them and to us this morning? He doesn't call the righteous. He doesn't call those who are self-righteous. The understanding here of righteousness is that they have a self-righteousness, not an alien righteousness. Those are some theological terms. We don't possess a righteousness that we can stand before God. We can't do anything in and of ourselves. We merit no works that we can lay before the throne of God in heaven and say, by these works I am justified. By these works I'm righteous. Only the works of Christ. We talk about Christ in two ways, who he is and what he has done. It is by works, by the way. This morning you understand one thing. It is by works. It's by the works of Jesus Christ. Christ fulfilled what we needed. The perfection that we could never, ever attain to is fulfilled in Christ. He has fulfilled the law. He has taken away Mount Sinai's thunder. He has quelled all of that. He has finished it for us. He is the one that we look to to fulfill the law for each and every one of us through faith in his son, a gift given to us by God. The faith that we exercise is given to us by God. By his grace, you're saved through faith. Faith in who? Faith in Christ and his faithfulness. Christ is faithful to do the work which God gave him to do. The Father sent him. The Father sent him to do the work which we could never do. So we are not saved by any works which we do or by any righteousness of our own. We are made to be righteousness, righteous. There's a difference between impartation and imputation. How many of you know those two terms? Feel areas like, what are you talking about? Impartation is something that other religions believe in, that it's imparted to you because you've done something worthy. That's impartation. Imputation, you have no merit. God has put it upon you by no merit, by nothing of your own, but by God's grace. He makes you a vessel to receive his mercy. He has made you a vessel to receive his mercy. If you profess faith in Jesus Christ, if you do that constantly every day, that's not just a one-time thing, guys. That's something we acknowledge every day. Every day we should be acknowledging our faith, which God has given us, in his son, Jesus Christ, following him every single day. God's gift to us, that faith. So we are made to be righteous by God's grace through faith, which are both a gift of God. That gift is given to the ones who know they are sinners. Did you walk through the door the other day saying, I'm a sinner, I need to be in church? Did you wake up this morning going, I'm a sinner, I need to be forgiven? I'm forgiven and I need to be forgiven more because I got past, I got present, and I got future. Now, we're supposed to minimize the future, right? Everybody say, shake your head, yes, right? We're supposed to be fighting against it so that the future looks better than the past, but there's the present and there is a future. There are sins that we will have to deal with. There are things that we have to come to grips with, but he humbly seeks Do we humbly seek God's mercy in that? Do we seek God's mercy in recognizing our sin? So a lot of times, you know, maybe I come down hard from the pulpit. Maybe I I, I say, I talk about sin too much. But think about it. If we rightfully understand our sin, then we rightfully understand grace. If we don't rightfully understand how much sin there is, we don't understand how much grace has been given to us. And then where's the thankfulness, right? He who has forgiven much loves much. I love God much because I see how much he's forgiven me. Now, it's not that I want to have a clothesline out here, right? If I put a clothesline out here and hung all of our sins on it, that would be disgusting. We don't need to do that. But within ourselves, we confess those sins. We confess those sins to God. Let me take you a couple places in in Scripture this morning. Would you please open up to Titus chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Let's just read about the kindness of God in the incarnation. As, As Paul is encouraging Titus, he wants Titus to have a good understanding of what righteousness is. He wants Titus to have an understanding because Titus is going to go out and he's going to equip elders. He's going to go out on the missions field. And he's been given instruction from an apostle. He is now going to be an elder training up other elders. And so in Titus 3, we read this. And starting in verse 4, it says, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared... He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. Nothing we have done in righteousness, nothing we can do to do that, but the converse, but according to his mercy, according to God's mercy. How merciful is God? We talked about according, that word according there is like if I give you, if I'm a billionaire and I give you $20, is that really according to my wealth? I give you $40,000, that's according to me being a billionaire, right? I don't have a billion dollars, so I can't do that. But to give you according to my wealth would be $40,000. That would be in accord with. So it says, but according to his mercy. How much mercy does God have? It's an infinite amount of mercy. 
You receive the infinity of God's mercy in this. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. He puts his spirit within you to do that. He cleanses you. Can you ask the spirit to come into your heart and mind? Can you command the third person of the Trinity to do that for you? Absolutely not. God has to send the spirit. That's what the the, the issue is with Nicodemus in John 3. The spirit goes where it wishes. Now, how many of you see the wind today? Anybody see the wind today? No, you saw the effects of the wind today, I hope. I saw a little bit of the leaves rustling outside. I saw the effects of the wind, but I can't see the wind. That was the illustration that he uses in John 3 for the effects of the Spirit. We don't know where it goes, but we can see its effects. We can see changed lives. We can see how he changed our lives. So it's the renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Verse 6, Titus 3, 6. Whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Through the means of Christ our Savior, not through our means, but through the means of his Son, our Savior, so that for the purpose of being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We inherit something, nothing here on earth. In this story we have this morning, in this picture in Mark's gospel, we see Levi. This man was wealthy, a wealthy, wealthy man, but he had traded something for that wealth. May it be that we never trade anything for earthly wealth because we have an inheritance We have an inheritance of eternal life coming to us. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at what Peter wants to always put before us. Peter understood this inheritance in the first chapter of 1 Peter. But in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 21 to 25, he gives us the example of Christ. For you have been called for this purpose. Since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness." So there is still something we do according to that righteousness. According to the righteousness given to us, we do what? We die to sin. We put sin to death. We live to righteousness. We live a life that honors God out of gratitude for the grace he's given to us. Not to try and gain favor with God, not to appease God. No, we live a life of righteousness because of what he's done for us. It's a gracious thing we do. It's a grateful thing. It's a grateful thing that we do. We acknowledge and are in awe of the righteousness of God. We're in fear of that. We're amazed by that. Continue on in verse 24 of 1 Peter chapter 2. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. I echo that many times in my prayers. Shepherd and guardian of our souls. The shepherd and guardian of our souls. Thank you for the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Thank you for your son, O Father. Thank you for Jesus Christ who shepherds us. A shepherd watched over his sheep. A shepherd knew the sheep. A shepherd looked at the sheep every single day when they came into the pen. He watched over them. He anointed them with oil. He checked for any scratches or any bruises. He made sure that they were in perfect care as they went into that pen. And he was a guardian over them. He watched over them. And they knew his voice. When the shepherd called, what did those sheep do? They followed that voice. Are we following the voice of Christ this day? Are we listening for that voice? Are we reading the word of God saying, Christ, show me what I'm to be today. Show me where I'm to go today. Show me the things you want me to do. Give me your counsel through the power of your spirit, through the power of your word. Being in the word and being in prayer. Father, show us, show me what it is today that you would have me to do. What do you want me to declare to your people from the pulpit to the people today? The amazing grace of God. You're righteous because of God's grace. He put his righteousness on you so you can stand before him in a judge room and not be condemned. You'll be found innocent because of the righteousness that you don't possess. A righteousness that only God could give to us. But it comes at a great cost. It doesn't cost you anything. It cost him his son. It cost him his death, his burial, and then his resurrection, his victory. These are the things that Jesus has been preaching. If you turn back with me, turn back with me to Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Look back with me just as review back into chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. What is Jesus preaching? Jesus leaves the house and he goes back out to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes out. What is the sum total of his preaching? How does Jesus describe it? Look in verse 14 of Mark 
chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. The kingdom, too, if you look up at the top again, he's talking about the kingdom. The gospel is the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent, turn from your sin, and look to Christ. Repent of these things, not just once, all the time. Your mind should be changing. Metanoia, the changing of our mind, the changing of the way we think. Yes, you're going to repeat sins, but every time you should be thinking differently about that. It's like, why, Lord? Why, Lord? What do I need to put in my life to evade, to put this to death? Why are these things continually coming upon my life? What do I need to do to rightly understand this so that I can put barriers in my life? What do I need? Lord, show me. Work through your church. Work through the people in the church to help me and guide me in that. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in what we just read in 1 Peter. Repent and believe that Jesus pays for your sins. Past, present, and oh yes, future. We're not out of this yet. We aren't out of this yet. So that's the sum total of what he's preaching. So let's look at verses 13 and 14. And for to get, for to this morning, I want to give you some pegs to hang things on. I want to cut this up into four, four points. So there's four points I want to show you this morning from the text. It revolves around these main points. There's the call of a rejected sinner. Levi, we need to really look hard at Levi. This is, Ma- this is Matthew. This is the calling of Matthew, the disciple, who will be an apostle, who will write the gospel of Matthew. You need to look long and hard at this man. You need to look long and hard at where he comes from. You need to look long and hard at the rejected sinner that Matthew is, that Levi is. These fishermen would have been astounded. He's already called four, right? He's already called four of his disciples. Peter and Simon and John and James, right? I hope I got that right. I didn't write it down. Correct me if I'm wrong. But he's got four of his disciples with him. These four disciples are what? They're fishermen. What's Levi? Levi's a tax collector. So let's talk about this. So the first thing we talk about is a rejected sinner. The second thing I want to talk about this morning is a redeemed sinners. And then the fourth thing is this idea of the, re- the reaction. The reaction of the self-righteous. How do they re- react? So you've got a rejected sinner. You've got a redeemed people group. You've got a reaction of the self-righteous and you've got a response to that. So you've got a rejected, you've got a redeemed, you've got a reaction and a response. By the way, I came up with that all on my own. Nobody gets credit for that. I found four R's. It's pretty cool. I'm like, oh, I'm back in seminary. I never liked that, so I usually don't do that. So I'm giving you guys four pegs this morning. Please forgive me if you need that in your life. I don't usually do that. Let's look at this rejected sinner. So verse 13, 13 and 14 is the rejected sinner. And he went out again by the seashore and all the people were coming to him and he was teaching them. We already covered that. What was he teaching them? Verses 14 and 15 of Matthew or of Mark 1. He was teaching them about the kingdom of God. He was teaching them about repentance and belief in the gospel, the good news. In verse 14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. An immediate response. An immediate response by Levi. Who is this man, Levi? We, know, we can look at Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, and see that Miss Matthew, this Levi is Matthew. Most of you probably have that in italic somewhere, but he's basically Levi, but his name would have been Matthew that he goes by. Think about it too. As I start to explain to you Levi's position, you probably would have wanted to change your name being this guy. This guy was somebody who everybody hated, hated. His testimony in court would not be valid. He would not be able to go into the synagogue and listen to God's word. He would not have any rights amongst the Jewish people. They looked at him as a traitor. They would want him better off dead or actually dead in this way, drugged behind a cart until he died. This man was absolutely hated by the Jewish community. He had no rights in the Jewish community to such an extent that even the rabbi said that such a man you could lie to and not have a problem with. Wait a minute, the, Torah, the, the law says not to lie. The law says not to bear false witness. But according to this, if this man were to approach you, you could actually lie to a man who is a tax collector and not suffer any ramifications according to the law and the rabbis. That's how much Levi is hated. Now, he's also a man who probably is underneath another tax collector. There's two kinds of tax collectors in the culture. So here's your historical, here's your historical background. Two kinds of tax collectors. One tax collector would gather all the land tax, the poll tax, the grain taxes. That was called a, a go-by. 
Nice name. Go buy all your taxes, right? So that was your pool taxes. Uh, that was your land taxes. Those were the major taxes. We understand those kinds of taxes, right? You have a tax on your house, your land. But this tax collector would have been a Moki, and he would have had someone underneath him. The fact that Levi is sitting in the tax booth, somebody else owned that franchise. Rome would sell franchises of tax collectors. So you had to buy a franchise. You negotiated with Rome on how much you were going to give to Rome, and then you kept the proceeds. Everything else that you could gain from that. But Rome had a certain amount that you had to get. Herod, I think Herod Antipas is the one that would be collecting in this region of Galilee. But as a Moki, you bought a franchise. And then you put somebody else in the tax booth who was a little Moki. Don't say monkey because that's not what it means. So that's Levi. Levi is the guy working for the guy who has the franchise. Now, how does Levi, Matthew, how does he make his money? Well, he has to go and ask for more. He has to not even post it on the, on the bulletin board. He just comes up with this arbitrary amount and collects it because he can keep the extra. Ooh. And where's he located? On the Capernaum. He's in Capernaum. What is Capernaum? It's the largest fishing city. Who are the other four disciples? They're fishermen. This is the guy who taxes them. This is the guy who pushes for extra money. This is the guy they hate because he's taken fish out of their kids' mouths. This is who Levi is. You've got to just sit there and be astounded that Jesus says, follow me. And he immediately responds with four fishermen standing behind him, other disciples standing right there. They would hate this guy because he would arbitrarily come up with more taxes to make his riches. And you're just sitting there going, wow. But his response is this. He's got up and followed him. Here's this man that everybody hates. They would like to see him drawn and quartered. They'd like to see him just drugged to death, right? And here are four fishermen standing behind Jesus who have heard him say, follow me. They gave up everything in an honorable trade of fishing on the, uh, on the Lake of Galilee at the city of Capernaum. They gave it all up to follow Jesus. And they're calling this guy, this is the worst of the worst. If this guy even comes in your home, your home is unclean. The rabbi said, if you even allow this man to come in your home, he's unclean. If he offers alms, you deny it. If he gives any money at also at, at any point in time, you deny it because it's from robbery. He's a thief. He's a scoundrel. He works around other people. This is what we're talking about. This is Levi. And what does he do? Jesus says, follow me. And he got up and followed him. He just flushed a franchise. Now, I'm thinking about Chick-fil-A right now. How many of you guys are thinking about Chick-fil-A? They're not open on Sundays. It's a great franchise, 10,000 bucks. You can open a Chick-fil-A. My wife and I were thinking about this. Hey, that'd be a good thing. Anyway, sorry. It, it is, used to, is used to illustrate my point. No one would just give up a franchise. You establish a franchise. You have a franchise. You have a means of living. You have, have good wealth coming in. A steady income is coming into you. And you just walk away from it. That's Levi. Levi just walked away from the whole thing. He absolutely just drops it all. Drops everything, drops his franchise, drops his paying job. That He's making good money. He has got to be making good money because when he's getting to the next scene, he's got a big house with lots of people coming in. He gave it all up. He just dropped it. That's got to be a sign of repentance. That's got to be a sign of regeneration. That's got to be a sign for Levi coming to a new way of thinking. He's repented of his sins and he's now believing in Christ. He more than likely knows who Jesus is. Jesus, remember, set up his ministry there in Capernaum. That was his hometown. Levi knows who this is. And when Jesus says, follow me, he is more than willing to drop everything and follow him. A rejected sinner, one who is rejected by all of his people, his parents, everybody, has wants nothing to do with Levi. And yet here comes Jesus saying, I'll take him. How many of you are Raiders fans? I love the Raiders for one reason. They take all the guys that are washed up and they make something out of them. John Madden just passed away. Sorry, this is personal for me, Okay. But they always take the worst up guys and they make something out of them. Illustration, Levi. Levi's a nobody. Levi's somebody that nobody wants to be around. Jesus is going to take him, going to make him an apostle. He's going to write a gospel. He's going to categorize and keep track of everything Jesus does. Here's a man who is rejected, who is a traitor to his people. And Jesus says, I'll take him. I'll take that sinner. See why I want you to recognize that you're sinners today? Because Jesus says, I'll take you. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I'll take you. Jesus says, I'll take you. I'll clean you up. 
while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't come to church because you got clean last night. You come to church because you need to be cleaned up, right? When people tell you, oh, hey, I'll come to church when I get my life together. I said, no, you need to come now. Today's a good day. If you're thinking that way, now you should come because we're all messed up. We just dress nice sometimes. I showered this morning. I'm good. I'm ready to come here. While we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were incapable, unable to come to God, he died for us. While we were sinners, we were saved by God's grace. He died for us while we were sinners. Levi is getting it. He's getting the grace of God. This is the rejected sinner. This is the man nobody would be around. This is a man that if you touch him, it was worse than a leper. Actually worse than a leper in the consideration of the people of Israel. You're worse than a leper. We want nothing to do with you. Wow. That's who Jesus saves. We need to take note of that because we're just like Levi. We're there. We're that sinner. We're in that group. Are we saved by God's grace? Are we in awe of that? So this is Matthew. We're talking about the Mishnah. Let's move on. 15. Let's talk about this, this crowd of people that are around him, the redeemed sinners that come around him. Look at verse 15. And it happened that he was reclining at the table in his house, and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many of them, and they were following him. Look how many times he says many. Matthew had a large house. He was a tax collector. He was a moki. He had a very, very profitable business. Large house. Now it's filled with tax collectors and sinners because those are the only people he would have been able to associate with. And Jesus is right there in the midst of them. No rabbi would have ever even taken the invitation. No rabbi would have even considered going there. Jesus has already established himself as a rabbi. He has already made himself known to the Pharisees in the last section we read in Matthew, in Mark, in Mark 110, that he is God, that he forgives their sins, that only God can forgive their sins. He's established that. He's also established himself as a rabbi. No rabbi would have even considered sitting in this man's house. But there's Jesus right in the middle of them. Now, understand this too. This isn't like we're sitting in these chairs. They're lounging. They're laying right next to each other. How many of you guys cuddle? Just, I'm, I'm talking to the men and women, the wives here. You guys cuddle on the couch? You know, you're this close, right? You're kind of sitting there next to each other. Nobody cuddles? It's just an illustration. You guys can, you know, it's okay. Don't be embarrassed. You're this close, right? That's what it was like to eat back in then. We, we sit at a table and we've got our plastic silverware and our little, everything's disposable, right? Not then. They sat right on top of each other. They sat next to each other. They're touching each other. They're, 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 in, they're in this position where they're very, their feet are out from the table. They're leaning on the table. They're eating one hand out and they're just right next to each other, touching each other. And Jesus is in the midst of them. Jesus is embracing this whole tribe of rejected sinners, these redeemed. He's right there reclining with them for a good long time too. The language of this text says that it happened for a long time. He's reclining at the table in the house and many tax collectors and sinners were dining with Jesus and his disciples for dining, uh, for dining with his Jesus and his disciples for there were many, 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 many sinners, many tax collectors in this house. Thieves, robbers, thugs, right? You would have thugs because if you're a Moki, you'd have thugs to do, do your work for you, right? You were the little weasel guy. And you had thugs to go do your work. So they're all there. You got thugs. You got prostitutes. You got everybody who's in that group. And where's Jesus? Right in the middle of it. Right in the middle of it. Can you out God? Please don't try. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. Even so, Paul would tell us, even so, don't sin. Fight sin. But his grace abounds our sins. That's who he sits amongst. He sits amongst redeemed sinners. Do you want to be identified as a sinner today? You should say yes. Yes, only because of this one. A disciple. This is the first time in verse 15 that the word disciple is used. The Greek word meaning a learner. Now that's something more than we think. That's not just someone who comes to class once a week. 
That's someone who follows someone intimately. That's someone who's involved in their life. Every single day, you ate with them, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You slept in their, in their proximity. You did everything with them. Your life was a mirror of their life. A disciple was a learner who attached themselves to their teacher, to their rabbi. That's what's being spoken of here, that these are the disciples that are coming there. These are the learners. These are the ones that Jesus has come to. These sinners in this room are gonna be his disciples. They're following him. So this banquet became like a revival. Jesus is in the midst of this revival. So the Messiah himself extended grace to them and many of them believed in him, repenting, rethinking their, their sins, following the example of Levi, who's now Matthew. What's the reaction of the self-righteous? Let's continue on. What's the reaction? Jesus is in the midst of them. Shouldn't the reaction have been, wow, look at the grace that this rabbi is showing. Wow, look at the grace. This rabbi is going into these people who need his teaching. Wow, that's amazing. Shouldn't that have been the reaction? Is that our reaction? Wow, are we amazed that God came and found us? He came to seek and to save the lost. In Luke 19.10, what was Jesus' mission? To come and to seek and to save the lost. Are we amazed that he found us? Are we amazed that Jesus came and he found us? He opened our eyes. He put his spirit within us. And all of a sudden it's like, why didn't somebody tell me this earlier? That was my response at 21 years of age. I'm like, I went to 12 years over there at the school. I didn't get none of this. You come in here and tell me I'm a sinner and I ain't got no chance and I'll get up and what? God's offering this. How much does this cost? Free? Wow. That should be the response by the Pharisees standing outside. That should be the response of all of us. Wow. Am I amazed at the grace of God? Wow. God's grace is amazing. 16. Verse 16 of chapter 2 of Mark. It says, When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating With the sinners and the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, notice they don't even talk to him. Why don't they go talk to him? They find some of the disciples and corner them outside. They corner some of the disciples and they want an answer from them because he should have taught them why he's doing this. Why is he eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Some of your translations might say the sinners. It's a category of people. So it encompasses more than just sinners. It encompasses those thugs, those thieves, those false testifiers, all of that would have been encompassed when he says sinners, not just tax collectors, but all of those associated with them. All of, the, all of the associates. Why is he eating and drinking with them? Why? Because he's gracious. Turn with me to Mark. I'm sorry, Matthew. Turn with me to, to, to Matthew. Matthew chapter nine. This is the version that Matthew will give of this event. I think it's very pointed for us. As Mark was reading, he's reading from another version that said that there was this idea of repentance. Not only to believe, but to repent. But in Matthew's rendition, who was there, let's take a look at this. In Matthew 9, 9, down to verse 13, let's see what Jesus says in Matthew's account, which adds to what we see here in Mark's account. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. This is exactly what Mark tells us. Verse 11. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, Matthew tells us he heard it. When Jesus heard this, he said, It is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn. Here's the second. Verse 13 is what I want you to key in here on Matthew 9, 13. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. Hosea 6, 6. What does God want us to do? He wants us to be compassionate. God wants us to find compassion in what we do in our day-to-day life. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I don't care what you do externally. I want your heart to be compassionate. I don't care what you do. If you come to church, if you do all these things, it doesn't matter to me. What is your heart doing? Is your heart compassionate? Is your heart merciful? Is your heart gracious? For I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. God wants us to realize how much we've been forgiven so that we're compassionate to others. Do we have a desire today? Think about this. Do we have a desire today that God would be compassionate to the unbeliever, wherever they may be? Do we have a desire for that? 
He wants us to be compassionate. Are we compassionate? He wants us to be compassionate. He's saying this to the Pharisees, and they're not getting it. This isn't for their instruction. This is for our instruction. Are we compassionate? Are we compassionate? What was their response? Their response was, why is he doing this? This is absolutely, and remember in their minds, this is blowing their minds. They're thinking this is worse than being with lepers. He's made this house unclean. He's made Levi's house unclean. Levi is unclean. These sinners are unclean. The rabbi that is proclaiming to be the son of God who has demonstrated this already, he has already demonstrated that he is God in flesh. In Mark's account, he's already demonstrated he's forgiven sins and he healed the paralytic. He's already demonstrated to them. They know who this is. In some regards, they've got to know who this is. Only God can forgive sins and he gave the sign in healing the paralytic. The man just walked out of that room just like that. They know who he is. In some regards, they know who he is. Why is he eating with them? Why is he eating with them? Because he wants them to be compassionate. He's showing compassion to them. And the last thing is the reaction. In verse 17, and hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Do we realize that we're sick? How many of you go to the doctor on a regular basis? You guys, by the way, you should go to the doctor once a year, get a complete physical, blood test, everything else. Everybody done that this year? I haven't done that since COVID. I need to do that. You should go to the doctor once a year, right? But when do you go to the doctor? My arm's hanging off and I don't know why. It's, it's not working, right? Maybe I'll go to the doctor. Usually what do you do? Let's go to WebMD and figure it out myself, right? Hmm. The good physician is there. You can't figure it out yourself. The issue is sin. We can't figure that out. We can't figure out God's grace. We can't figure out his mercy. We can't figure out the gospel. God's got to come to us. God's got to make himself known to us. And then we hold on to him for dear life because we need this physician. We need the good shepherd. We need the one who's the guardian of our souls every single day. Peter had it right. Peter has it very right. The shepherd and guardian of our souls. That's who we need. We need him. Don't turn there, but I just want to read you the account that Luke, that Luke records. In Luke 18, 9 through 14, we read this. He also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves. Do we do that? How many times do we just trust in ourselves? Who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. May that never be us. Two men went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying to himself this. God, I thank you that I am not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, a sign of humility, a sign of penance, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Not a sinner, the sinner. He would echo with Paul, the greatest of all sinners. This tax collector understood his need for God to be merciful to him. I tell you, and then Jesus jumps back in. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. He who recognizes his utter need for a savior. Are we in that position every single day? That isn't a one-time event. That wasn't at youth camp when you were 10 or 12 years old, when you went down and you raised your hand and you went down and you prayed to receive Christ. Or later on in your life, like me, when you came to the Lord, when you put your faith in Christ, there was a one-time event there where I confessed my sin and I needed a Savior. I confessed my sin. Every single day, we need to recognize we're that group of people. We're Levi. We're this group of people. We're the tax collectors. We're the sinners. We're these people who were once that, but now we're redeemed. Once that, but no longer. God seeks those who recognize their sinfulness. Why do we want to recognize our sinfulness? God seeks those who recognize their sinfulness, cry out for mercy, and depend fully on his grace. By contrast, the Pharisees were so far from God that although they could identify other people as sinners, how many of you can do that? Everybody's like, uh-oh. 
We can identify the sin in other people, can't we? We can call them out. Usually the reason why you can identify, just, just this is a counseling thing, I, this is not part of the preaching session. The reason you can identify sin in somebody else is because it's in you. Don't think that that's not the case. Read Galatians chapter two, or Galatians chapter six, verses one and two. Examine yourself before you go to them. Examine yourself because you probably have that sin that you identify in someone else because you possess that sin. That's a good litmus test for us. We can see sin in other people. That's why the Pharisees could see it. That sin was evident in them. They could see sin in others, but they didn't recognize it themselves because they did not have the grace of God. They did not have the spirit of God. They were unable to recognize their own miserable condition because God had not given them their spirit. Vessels of mercy prepared beforehand. Do we echo what we see in Romans 9? That God prepared vessels of mercy beforehand that he would pour his mercy into us. We need to be reminded of these things. I want to close with 1 Corinthians 6. Would you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. Paul wants to make this known to those in Corinth or those in California, as we sometimes say. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9, 10, and 11. I will close with this, just as a reminder for us. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We like to stop right there, don't we? How many of you would just prefer not to go on? Because what comes next? Such were some of you. Paul's not letting anybody off the hook this morning. He's not letting me off the hook. He's not letting you off the hook. Such were some of you, but. Oh, the word in scripture I love the most is the word but. Do you guys have an, do you guys have an affinity for the word but like I do? It flips it all over. God, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God, but God did this, but God did this, but God saved you, but God gave his son, but God. How many times, just put that in the internet and see what happens to your computer. Should go, Such were some of you, but you were washed. Why were yet sinners? Christ died for us. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our Lord, of our God. God put his spirit within you. The spirit of almighty God dwells within you. Does that make you want to go, whoa, should. You should be thinking, the only reason I understand the gospel is because the Spirit of God dwells within me. Therefore, I have been made holy. I've been sanctified. I've been washed. I now walk a life to please him, to honor him. I want to pursue him in righteousness and godliness. I want to be like him in this life and in the life to come. Paul doesn't let us get away from this. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, set apart, cleansed, but you were justified. You stand now before God, innocent, because of the righteousness put upon you by our Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. Oh, that we cry out for the spirit every single day and his counsel to be amongst us through his word, through the spirit to guide us to honor our Lord and Savior. Let us take this and be mindful of this. Jesus hangs out with sinners. Isn't that amazing? How many of you want to now go out of here saying, I'm a sinner. And Jesus is my friend. He's not condoning your sin. Let me just make one thing really clear. I just thought about this. He's not condoning the sinner. He's saying, you need a savior. I want to know about my sin so I rightly understand my need for a savior every single day. Now, after this, if you guys want to come up and tell me what I've sinned against you, please go ahead and do so and we can move on from there. But for now, I'm okay being a sinner because I'm saved. That's the only reason I can identify my sin is because I know that Christ is my physician and I can go to him every single day. I need a physician. Do you need a physician? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the shepherd and guardian of our souls. May we think about that. May we be mindful of that, that we have a shepherd and guardian of our souls. Your son, our savior, the good shepherd, the great shepherd. We hear his voice, we follow him. He cares for us. He anoints our head. He leads us beside still waters. 
He makes us lie down because we're stubborn. He makes us to lie down. Father, help us to just, just marvel in the greatness of the shepherd who you've given to us and marvel the fact that he associates with sinners because we need a physician. We need a savior every single day. Bless your people, Father. Keep us very mindful of the gospel, of the person and work of your son and how we can rightly honor him in this life, especially for the life to come. Bless your people, Father, please. Bless them, keep them mindful. Keep me mindful, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen.